What is it about Chinese system that has made that incredible advancement possible? We were told when I was an undergraduate student that communism doesn't allow economic growth. Or we were told that in order to become developed, you have to follow the Western model. Well, China hasn't done any of those, and yet you say this is absolutely unprecedented and unique. What is the magic of the Chinese province? Well, again, a great question and complicated. Uh, so first to the premise and then to the, to the specifics. So the first chapter of the book is called The Rise of China. And as I try to document, never before has a nation risen so far so fast on so many different dimensions. A country that didn't even appear on the league charts 25 years ago now is a rival and even surpassing the U.S. in many, many different dimensions. Most Americans have not yet gotten this. Okay? So actually I say in the book that I, mean, I try in the first chapter to just kind of give you a jolt with the facts, but I quote Vaclav Havel, the former Czech president, with his wonderful uh, comment. He said, things have happened so fast, we haven't yet had time to be astonished. So I would say we should look at the facts and be astonished. So I have a, in the book I give a, a short form of a quiz that I give to my Harvard students. And it says, when could China become number one? And I have 26 indicators, largest middle class, uh, biggest manufacturer of cars, biggest manufacturer of uh, smartphones, uh, fastest supercomputers, largest number of billionaires, biggest economy in the world. So it's 26 indicators. And students write, they have to do the answers. 2030, they're guests, 2040, not in my lifetime. Then I show them chart two, which is also in the book. Tie heading of it, already. Already, all these things have happened. So China is today the largest economy in the world. So you might ask, well, why didn't somebody tell me? Okay. Because the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and even the Financial Times keep writing China is the second largest economy in the world. Go to the CIA website tonight. Go to the IMF website. By the yardstick they think is the single best measure for comparing national economies, China's economy is bigger than the U.S. economy today. Today. That was the big news out of the IMF World Bank meeting in Washington in 2014. You can go look at it. So on the current trajectory, China is going to be 40% larger economy than U.S. in 2024. So this is what they're looking at. So now, how do they do this? Well, that's as part of what we're watching in this, in the Xi revolution. Xi is first having a party that dominates everything. So this is a, it, it's still called the Communist Party, but they got rid of communism. I mean, there's nobody who believes in Marxism or Leninism. They, they can read some of these things. I don't know a single serious Chinese who thinks this is interesting. I mean, that, that just, they, they have it, having difficulty, it's their name, so how do we get rid of our name? So most of them just call it the Capital P Party. But they're absolutely clear, the party is going to lead everything. And if you listen to Xi's speech in, the, in Beijing last week, he said, the party is going to dominate the society. The party is going to dominate the economy. The party is going to dominate the military. The party is going to, so everything, party, 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 party. So here he's trying to resuscitate a party that, uh, uh, I, I would say the way to think of it is, it's a version of Leninist mandarins. So this is a complicated idea. The mandarins were in the Chinese system, the extension of the emperor, and they were people that were selected by a competitive exam meritocratically, mm -hmm. and other citizens deferred to them because they were thought to be better you know, than I am. They competed. They have a higher sense of public interest. They're the extensions of the emperor. So they run the show. That's the way it works. So he's trying to resuscitate this idea so that of these 1.4 billion people, 80 million of them who happen to be party members and about 800,000 who are influential, they're going to rule and run things. I think we all have learned in political theory 
that such a system cannot work. And I'm still of a small d Democrat liberal, small l liberal in the sense that I think freedom for individuals is natural for everybody to, 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 be, to want. And I think democratic systems will be lousy except for the alternatives and ultimately will work better than the alternative. But if I watch the record of the 21st century, the last 17 years, you could have some doubts about that. And watching Washington, most people would say, how is this working and compared to how that's working? So she is putting in effect a challenge to us to say, we'll see how your system works and we'll see how our system works. I'm, I'm really shocked that you said you're a liberal and you come from Harvard. <laughs> well, is that, do they go together? Well, I, I said, be very carefully, I'm a small L liberal like Europeans. That is, I think, uh, it is closer to libertarian, because I think that basically individuals care about their freedoms, and I, I'm not a quote capital L Harvard liberal progressive. That is, I don't subscribe to most of that agenda. I'm more close to a small C conservative in that regard. So I'm a kind of a Burkean or John Stuart Mill liberal, not a in the current American tradition.